Also in 2012, he was awarded the inaugural Infosys Prize in the Humanities for outstanding contributions to literary studies. Now, in addition to and in parallel with his career as a writer and academic, Amit Chowdhury is a professional singer in the North Indian classical tradition. He has performed all over the world in most of the world's important venues, and he has been featured on radio and television, as well as releasing numerous professional recordings. Since 2005, he's also been performing experimental music. His first CD, This Is Not Fusion, and his second, Found Music, were both released to great critical acclaim within the last decade. He's also created a show, A Moment of Mishearing, combining a live concert with film, and this has been performed in numerous venues. The subject of his presentation tonight is music on the 25th story, the mimetic and the textual. Um, thanks, Susan. And I've done something, right? <laughs> no. Um, this is um, <clears throat> going to be one of probably the only fellows who's not going to make use of anything happening over there. There's this this picture is going to be on the screen, though. Have I have I shifted it by mistake, or is it is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, Anyway, that's, that is a picture of Cuff Parade, which I'm going to mention in, in my talk. I want to thank um, all of you and my colleagues or whatever, right, the fellows at the Institute and everybody who's been steering the Institute uh, and steering it so uh, satisfyingly and well uh, um, in its initial year. And um, I, I, I mean this because, uh, uh, because I've written what I'm going to read out. Uh, I'm I've written this here in Paris. I haven't written it in the office because I can't write it I in the office. But the being in the Institute has given me um, the time and the opportunity to, to begin this project, which I wanted to start. And, um, and, and, and so I'm reading from this project, which is a book on music. And. Um, I have to say I feel superstitious and nervous, or if I don't feel nervous, I feel nervous about not feeling nervous because I feel I f should be nervous about reading from a work in progress. Um, it's w the, almost the only time I've done something like this. I'm also, re I write longhand, so I'm very nervous about reading from my own illegible handwriting and it is gen genuinely, I don't exaggerate, I'm not being cute when I say it's Ill illegible. So I've been cramming my own work in the last four days, uh, trying to familiarize myself. Um, so it's rather been like taking an exam, preparing for an exam, mainly because I can't read uh, half the things I, 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 I've written. Uh, I, I, w I will start now uh, at the beginning. <laughs> um, that was a time of unsettlement. After some uncertainty, my father was promoted. He took charge of his company. I always said his company in the way one might say his town when mentioning a place a friend belongs to. To mark our new life, we moved flats. We came to a four-bedroom flat with a study in Cuff Parade, the result of joining two flats on the top story together. We looked out on the marine drive and the sea from the opposite side of where we'd lived for 10 years. I could see from the balcony adjoining the drawing room, the building I'd grown up in. I think I was 16. I was acutely unhappy. We seemed to have moved a great distance. Disassociation had always hurt me like physical pain and I'd never felt as disassociated as then. A change was coming over me. I had a wisdom I'd never had before and have never had since. I remember sitting in the drawing room that first evening. I didn't know where my parents were. I sat semi-visible on a sofa that seemed more plush than necessary. I was like someone who finds he's out of a job. I delayed my arrival for as long as I could, 
like I did today for the talk. And now found myself in a vacuum I was told was my home, feeling neither a sense of expectancy nor homecoming. The flat was coming into being. Things were being unloaded and fitted. The 25-story building was in the last stages of completion. On the other side of the water, I could see if I focused the outline of the past. Cuff Parade was the place where it came to me that I had no real home, that habitation for me consisted of people, primarily my parents. I was where they happened to be. I was no longer in school. I was in junior college. I went every day to Elphinstone, Elphinstone College to attend classes. I used to play the guitar and had begun to write songs in keeping with Neil Young and Dylan, whom I didn't much care for. In the manner of most phases in pop history, that era seemed over almost as soon as, as it had begun, and I, who had never been to America, found myself caught awkwardly on its outer edge, perhaps unaware that my moment as a singer-songwriter had passed, perhaps unwilling to suddenly let it go. Among the things that were distracting me just then, in the midst of my virginal ex explorations of what it meant to be a young songwriter in Bombay, was Hindustani classical music. I had heard or overheard Indian classical music as a child. A man or a woman would be singing on the radio. I never dreamed then that I'd have anything to do with this tradition. My incredulous dismissal then is in its own way a happy memory to do with a time when I was still unrelated to what would consume me ten years later. The singing was at once utterly alien and instantly parodiable. This dismissal, in fact, is the default response to khayal singing, well before we get to know what the khayal is, the predominant genre in North Indian classical vocal music, and vaguely term its recognizable strangeness classical music. Those who later become acquainted with its extraordinary melodiousness forget <coughs> that on an initial encounter it had sounded unmelodious. There may be many reasons for this first misprision. In this case, it may have had to do with the fact that all kinds, old and young, talented and less talented, got annual slots to sing on All India Radio once they had passed an audition. How did they pass an audition if they didn't sing well? A singer of what are called light classical forms in India would reply, because pure classical music relegates tone and beauty to secondary status or gives them no status at all and privileges mastery of grammar. This is not quite true but has enough truth to explain why people with voices that aren't musical sing khayal with authority. Another reason might be that all forms of classical music pursue tonality to an extremity. Once the ear becomes used to the extremity, it hears beauty. The convergence between extremity and beauty particularly applies to the most sensuous vehicle of melody, the human voice. Where the singing opera or the khayal, the voice, in completely different ways in different traditions will seem far removed from its normal range and function, encroaching upon registers that sound unnatural, so that it might provoke laughter or cause impatience. Classical music might comprise one's cultural heritage, but it also has an air of deep foreignness. Music was one facet of Indian culture that, for instance, the English colonizers simply didn't understand and didn't care to. But Indian classical music is almost as incomprehens incomprehensible to most Indians as it was to the English. One presumes uh, the, the air of foreignness marks European classical forms too, not only for people from non-European countries, but for those to whom, say, opera is a cultural inheritance. As far as alienated Indian responses to Western classical music are concerned, two come randomly to mind. The first is from my mother. She once told me that when she first began to hear strains of Western classical music when living in London with my father in the 50s, they made her profoundly sad. Then there's Tagore in his memoir, Jibon Sriti, speaking about his years in London between 1878 to 80. 
A woman singing reminds him of a horse neighing. The piano is an inferior instrument because of its inability to execute glissandos. The violin is preferable. Of course, Tagore's remarks arise partly from politics and colonial tension. They, mark a, they mask a shrewd and deeply creative interest in Western music common to many Indian composers. There may be another reason why my aversion to Indian classical music turned to devotion. It has to do with the unpredictability of our lives as readers and writers, listeners and musicians. What's bored us might begin to obsess us. What seemed important might one day lose interest. You can't be prepared by education, say, to love Indian classical music. The change of direction may occur in a way one had no warning of. You find a point of entry you hadn't necessarily been looking for. This might also happen while reading a book. The book, let's say, is a canonical one. You read three pages and it does nothing for you. A year later, you pick it up again and read to the fourth page and it does nothing. One day you read it determinedly with, without pleasure and on page 125, you're struck by a phrase or simile. It unlocks the book's language and teaches you how to read it. The point of, point of entry comes to you unawares. Once it does, it makes a world or work available to you that you'd had no time for. Until 1977, when I finished school, I wanted to be a pop, then a rock musician. My parents, probably thinking I would become a chartered accountant, allowed me this fantasy. My father, an extraordinarily uh, kind man, sponsored my explorations. As a result, I possessed a Yamaha acoustic guitar with a sweet, expansive sound and an Ibanez, both of them procured from Denmark Street on trips to London. In 1978, I left school and my anomalous sight found expression. I turned into a quasi-modernist. I wrote imitations of Beckett's early incomprehensible English poems, themselves imitations of Eliot. I was able to grow my hair to a length of my choosing. I entered junior college in Elphinstone College and pretended to be a BA student. Junior college is when it's high school basically, but you are allowed to get out of school and go into a college to attend high school. <coughs> so I pretended to be a BA student. I gave off the vibes of a drug addict without having touched an illegal substance. I made progress on the guitar very fast and started to write songs when I was 16. From a pop rock singer, I transformed that year to, as I've said elsewhere, a Canadian singer-songwriter in the making. The points of entry came around then. They recurred in a small, they occurred in a small cluster. Maybe it's in their nature to form a constellation in retrospect, where one is related to the other. The first was my music teacher's entry into our lives. He wasn't my music teacher then, he was my mother's. He was very young, I realize that now, possibly 34. He always wore a white kurta and white pajamas. His name was unforgettable, Govind Prasad Jaipurwale. My mother had a long list, my mother had had a long list of music teachers in Bombay. However talented they may have been, they were part of my mother's world, not mine. I mean, I wasn't interested in them except as characters in her world, which served as a backdrop to my everyday preoccupations. Govindji, as we called him, was the first of her teachers to access my world. Maybe at 16, I was ready. I first heard about him in a conversation a lyricist called Rajesh Jori had with my mother in the balcony of the flat in Malabar Hill. My mother felt her teacher at the time had nothing more to offer her. She and her teachers tired of each other periodically. Rajesh Jori then let drop that surname Jaipurwale, literally of Jaipur. It was already known to my mother, not to me, from his father Lakshman Prasad's reputation as a teacher. Hindi cinema is the yardstick for all success in Bombay and Lata Mangeshkar, famous singer in cinema, in, in the Hindi films, was rumored to have once wanted to learn singing from Lakshman Prasad Jaipurwale. How good is he, asked my mother, about the son. The father was by then dead. 
Is he better than X? She asked, referring to her present teacher, a perfectly good singer with not unusually alcohol-related problems. Better, said Rajesh Jory, X hasn't even been born in comparison. Wo uska samne paida bhi nahi hua. I remember my mother was amused by this rec recommendation. She repeated it to my father a few times in Rajesh Johari's voice. She was an excellent mimic. And Govindji became her teacher. I was struck by how beautiful his voice was. This meant, unlike many teachers of classical music whose voice wasn't necessarily their strong point, he could sing the so-called light forms, like the bhajans or devotionals that my mother wanted to learn from him, with quiet, blissful conviction. Just as pure classical singing was met with bewilderment and sometimes mocked by those who listened to the simpler forms, the simpler forms were slightly looked down upon by the classical world. I use the past tense because classical music is now so peripheral to the consciousness that what I've described no longer constitutes an urgent um, debate or misunderstanding. Nevertheless, I got the sense that Govindji was talk walking a tightrope in singing so many forms with such ease, that ease was suspect and that too much melodiousness risked not being accorded proper seriousness. He was a great pleasure to listen to the tone of his voice and a mastery that made you believe that, as is said of ustads or virtuosos, he could do anything with it. He sang softly without insistence and almost never sang the same phrase twice. His aim undertaken with modesty was to constantly surprise and be surprised. I wanted to do what he was doing. This was odd as I'd been content till then to sing songs with my guitar. But there was something contagious arresting and disruptive of the flow of time about being able to produce consecutively two or three versions of a phrase, each with a marginally different emotional impact, each new thought invoking and revising the previous one. I tried to do it when I was alone and stumbled. Clearly you couldn't produce these modulations just because you wanted to. Not long ago, I found myself discussing narrative with a group of academics over dinner. Someone agreed with the view that narrative didn't have to have a beginning, middle, and end in that order. I pointed out that there were narratives in which the beginning took up so much time that you didn't know when you were going to arrive at the actual story. Personally, this was the sort of narrative I liked. I told the academics what the filmmaker Gurvinder Singh had said in a talk about the screening of his first film, Anhe Ghoda Dadan, Arms for a Blind Horse, at a film festival in Canada. Singh said that the 10 to 15 minute prologue, which he showed us before his talk, had presented the director of the film festival with a problem. She wanted him to cut it and move straight into the main narrative. He said uh, he'd rather not show the film at all than dis dispense with the opening. The film's prologue was significant. Nothing happened in it except the establishment of a certain meandering lifelikeness. Since this lifelikeness, this quality of constantly revisiting the present moment is more important to me than the story, I secretly wanted Gurvinder's entire film to have been a prologue. I could see where the director of the film festival was coming from, but it wasn't where I came from. While writing these pages, I had the idea that I'd call the first chapter Alap, thereby playing on the meaning of one of the principal segments of Khayal. Alap means, presumably in all North Indian languages, introduction. It is also a major component of Khayal. The initial delineation of the raga before the vilambit or slow composition begins to the tabla's accompaniment is called the alap. So is the exploration of the raga in the vilambit composition where the singer ascends very gradually with a degree of reluctance from the lower to the upper tonic, subjecting the notes and various identifying phrases of the raga to repeated imaginative reinterpretation. This bit is called the alap too, 
it contributes through a progression of mainly glissandos to a full emotional and intellectual engagement with the raga and it can take us and it can take up to half an hour or more depending on the singer's inventiveness or from the point of view of, th of those who find classical music tedious his or her obduracy the alap in north indian music is everything its detail and intricacy justify the name of the genre khayal the arabic word for the imagination from the alap we move to the drut or fast tempo segments which are more virtuosic and less lyrical in character no other musical tradition allows the prologue to be definitive in quite this way not even the carnatic or south indian tradition or the drupad precursor to the khayal has a true counterpart to the seemingly unfettered divigation that the alap comprises carnatic performance has alapana a long opening without percussion in which the raga is established but alapana like the nom tom alap the alap using the syllables nom tom in in the drupad soon assumes a rhythmic form that is the syllables are sung in and out of meter although percussive accompaniment is still to come in the rhythmic element in alapa alapana and in the drupad's long introductory passages creates a sort of excitement in the performer to do with the climactic in the khayal however all expectation of the climactic is set to one side in fact the rhythmless alap in khayal is relatively short the percussion instrument the tabla soon joins the singer playing a time signature at an incredibly retarded tempo the singer proceeds in free time seemingly heedless of the time signature and the tabla player except when they must return periodically with the composition to the one the first beat of the time cycle the sama otherwise unlike carnatic music or the drupad free time reigns over a substantial part of the singer's exposition notwithstanding the tabla which in a feat of dual awareness the singer both nods to and largely ignores the alap is a formal and conceptual innovation of the same family as the circadian novel in which everything happens in an amplification of time before anything has begun to happen at what point north indian vocal classical singing allowed itself the liberty of making the introduction that is the circumventory but thorough exploration that differs and then replaces the main story become its definitive movement i don't know but it could go back to the 30s when ustad amir khan's romantic modernist proclivities left a deep impress on north indian performance the alap corresponds with my desire for narrative not to be a story but a series of opening paragraphs in which life hasn't already happened ready for recounting but is about to happen or is happening and can't be domesticated therefore into a perfect retelling should i call this chapter alap then or sh should i call the entire book by that name If the meeting with Govind Prasad Jaipurwale was a point of entry that drew me to a musical tradition I'd been indifferent to there would have been other points of entry before and after that one which made me turn to him as a teacher I'm speaking of late 70s Bombay a beautiful flat on Malabar hill a lifestyle of privilege in a socialist economy in which 80% of my father's salary was taxed a bombay in which there was a pretty clear demarcation between the black money that circulated in the business world and the white money my father earned a bombay 13 or 14 years before e economic deregulation so in spite of the privileges that derived from his company position my father's life remained essentially middle class on one side of us were the untaxed income and the monetarist religious values of the business classes on the other were the deprived and the educated people who aspired to the sort of life my father had my parents had no vanity this wasn't a conclusion i'd come to myself as i'd never subjected them to scrutiny but it was pointed out to me by other others later when they were old or after they had died i realized that these people were right i don't mean 
my parents were good, I mean they managed to remain human. For this reason, they spoke to each other in the Sileti dialect to the end of their lives. For this reason, we visited relatives annually in towns in northeastern India like Shilchar and Shilong, a liberating experience for all three of us. For this reason, there were hardbound copies of classic Bengali novels on the bookshelves besides beside Grolier classics, the Pelican edition of T.S. Eliot's selected poems, and biographies of Jackie Onassis and Marilyn Monroe. For this reason, there was music in the house. I mean that I had access to much more than a boy in comparable circumstances in Bombay would have had. I don't mean culture or what Bombay deemed to be culture. I mean other worlds. By other worlds, I'm thinking mainly of India's modern traditions, which I became aware of through my relatives, through the Bengali language and the hardbound volumes on the shelf. And I mean the classical ones, dance, music, sculptures, temples, mosques. Growing up in Bombay, my friends and I didn't del delve into these. We were in our own world of Sad Sack and Archie, of Elvis and later Dylan. I don't mean we were deracinated. We were part of a transmutation of what Indian reality could be. We felt Indian, but somehow also felt Woodstock was our inheritance. Something about our formation made us feel naturally at home in the American 60s, a decade that had just passed and had gone by for us without Vietnam. The English language dominated. In Bombay, the modern Indian languages were called vernaculars, and those who spoke them labeled vernacs. This is very different from uh, Calcutta uh, in Bengal. Um, I never picked up Marathi, though I was taught it in school. Indian music and Indian traditions felt quasi-religious and therefore discomforting. We, a secular class that had largely been educated in Christian schools and had no religion ourselves, firmly shut them out. Still, those other worlds were there, to be skimmed over in textbooks or for me encountered in songs overheard and towns visited. Some of the points of entry came to me from lighting upon Marathi programs on TV. I think TV came to Indian households in around 1970, comprising at first a few hours each evening about agriculture and industry. Or oh, that's how I remember it. By the mid 70s, there was a fully functional national channel which made accommodations for local programming at certain times of day. Then a second channel was added, in Bombay's case with principally Marathi content. In retrospect, I see that they had much that could lead to discovery. Why I chose in 1978, in that four-bedroom flat in Cuff Parade, to look beyond the modest English language entertainment, game shows like What's the Good Word, and sitcoms of the variety of Mind Your Language, towards the Marathi fair, I don't know. But I remember watching some episodes of Pratiba Ani Pratima, literally talent and profile, on Sunday mornings. I saw Kishori Amonkar on this program, replying to a question and then singing a few notes without any accompaniment. I was struck by the dark flow of the mirrors or glissandos and the voice's pure timbre. Having ignored Marathi all my life, I understood very little of what was passing between the singer and her interlocutor. It was like watching an art house film without subtitles. Full understanding wasn't a prerequisite, especially where music and not just words were, was concerned. On another Sunday, I saw Bhim Sen Joshi on the same show. At some point, he began to explore in passionate detail the notes of a tumri. Once more, I felt the urge, as I had with Govinji, to replicate what I'd heard. Once more, I found it near impossible to reproduce what had sounded fluent and spontaneous. Each encounter, Kishori Amonkar, Bhimsen Joshi, the singer Bal Gandharva, whom I heard one night on Channel 2, was, accompan uh, was accompanied by a jolt. I think it's safe to say that Bal Gandharva is almost entirely unknown outside Maharashtra. He was a star in the 30s and 40s in a form that specifically Marathi, Sangeet Natak, or music theatre, in which he sang Natya Sangeet, theatre music. He, pl he played women, mainly. <laughs> 
The channel showed pictures of him in a sari. I don't know if I happened upon this program because bored by life in Cuff Parade I was at a loose end or because I was scavenging, s scavenging for snippets of classical music, probably being by this time addicted. I was transfixed by the voice. It was so high-pitched it could have been a woman's, just as the singer Kesar Bais was so low-pitched it might have been a man's. Something spiritual happens when a voice departs its accepted register which is often determined by gender. This was the case with Bal Gandharva. His voice had a bodiless freedom and pliability. The songs he sang from the Natya Sangeet repertoire were Marathi, offshoots of classical compositions executed with an almost guileless virtuosity. With Bal Gandharva clearing his throat before he plunged into a new taan. I had no idea who he was. The program was Marathi. Besides, the channel behaved as if it was radio. The name of the song appeared on a wavering caption. It was played from a 78 RPM record. Um, I'm going to skip a bit and go to my discovery of, uh, I'm beginning to listen to uh, Western classical music, which is uh, the experience I refer to in the title. Um, so in bored and, and discovering Indian classical music in, in this apartment, uh, still not quite having given up the aspiration to be uh, a, a successful Canadian singer-songwriter, uh, um, I, I somehow, um, well, I discover a, a record collection of my father's, which he brought back from England, Herbert von Karajan's uh, uh, Beethoven, all, all the symphonies. And, and I begin to listen to Beethoven just to kind of, out of curiosity, really. I'd never listened to Western classical music, not because I disliked it, but because I disliked its followers. I'd noticed that most Indians who enthused about it were tone deaf. They had clearly acquainted themselves. I, 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 I have, I skipped the bit where I speak about the social reasons for Indian classical music having a very um, ambiguous status for the middle class. So I think I should just slip that in. Uh, the Western classical music has a particular kind of relationship uh, with uh, the middle class, a relig relationship with legitimacy maybe. Uh, and for a long time, Indian classical music for the same middle class, partly because of its religious content, partly because it was sung by semi-literate people or by courtesans or, or Muslim ustads, didn't have the same uh, legitimacy. Um, it was kind of kept at arm's length. Um, and I'm not talking about a deracinated, westernized middle class over here. I'm talking about a nationalist middle class, a secular middle class, who nevertheless, uh, while sort of becoming the new patrons of uh, Indian classical music, at the same time, kept it a bit at a distance. So he, here I am listening to uh, I'm listening to these records. They had, um, so I, I disliked it uh, because of its followers. I'd noticed that most Indians who enthused about it were tone deaf. This may not be a fair statement, but anyway, they had clearly acquainted themselves with it for reasons other than pleasure. They mentioned the names of compositions as if they were referring to privileged friends. Of course, there were, and th this is a very tiny minority because most Indians, educated or not, don't listen to Western classical music. Um, of course, there were exceptions. The filmmaker Satyajit Ray, whose contributions to music scores for cinema was profound, and the Parsis of Bombay, who had produced musicians like Zubin Mehta, or in another genre, Freddie Mercury. Um, I quickly became familiar with four of the symphonies. The fifth, of course, the sixth, the pastoral, the seventh, my favorite, and the ninth. And I'm a complete layperson when it comes to, uh, I speak as a layperson. Uh, while listening to the second movement of the seventh, gripped by its charged progress, I found myself looking beyond the penthouse opposite that was being made for the builder's daughter at the sky. Unlike other parts of Bombay and India, there was a deadness to earth and water in Cuff Parade because it was land that had been recently reclaimed for development. And I was on the 25th floor in a state of elevation that's unnatural to an Indian. <coughs> 
I was cut off from the world. This context was an appropriate one for listening to Western classical music, which to my ears had a closedness about it, the finality of an artifact. Looking out at the sky and the massive clouds, I could construct majestic inner narratives as I listened to the seventh and to the fifth. I became prone to receiving Beethoven in this dramatic narrative way. There's something about Western music that leads it, lends itself for the lay listener and for anyone attuned to the culture that produced it to representation. There are many like Helen in Howard's End who, in relation to the Fifth Symphony, quote, see heroes and shipwrecks in the music's flood, end quote. Or it's possible for the listener's passion to be mirrored in the music by Beethoven's life, quote, he brought back the gusts of splendor, the heroism, the youth, the magnificence of life and death, and amid vast roarings of a superhuman joy, he led his fifth symphony to its conclusion. End quote. Helen's imaginings and my own inquiry, storytelling, while I listened to the fifth in my small room, have a history. The fifth became known early on as a Schicksal symphony or symphony of destiny. Beethoven was going deaf while composing it, so the biographical narrative of impediment and triumph are inextricable from the music's effect on the lay but acculturated listener. The first enraptured critical response by E.T.A. Hoffman in 1810 in the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung is also heavy, heavily narratological. Quote, radiant beams shoot through this region's deep night and we become aware of gigantic shadows which, rocking back and forth, close in on us. End quote. Studying clouds from the 25th floor, I constructed, without necessarily meaning to, comparable epics around von Karajan's Beethoven. The sixth, which engrossed me less than the other works I've mentioned, but which I found very pleasing and listened to repeatedly, lent itself especially to my storytelling urges. I didn't feel the urges were wrong without knowing why I, I assumed they were a valid response to music. While listening to the pastoral, I was stirred by images of meadows, trees, weather, and valleys I'd never known. Just as a period film is incomplete without an appropriate score, a score requires the right kind of visual accompaniment. Not an actual film, but one you're making up in your head. It's possible, listening to the sixth, to invent a landscape you've never known, as if it had been bequeathed to you. In the way we are told it's possible for the brain to invent memories. Being Indian, I certainly hadn't encountered the world I now spontaneously generated while listening, except in picture books, painting, and movies. Surely none of us have, except in an interrupted residual state. Yet listening to the pastoral gave to that world a wholeness and continuity it can't possibly have now, if it ever did. Of course, the sixth had programmatic content. Beethoven had tied it to a narrative and, as a result, to emotional and historical verisimilitude. By verisimilitude, I don't just mean an approximation of reality, but a confirmation through effects and conventions of what we already know to be real. The first movement has to do with the arrival in the countryside, the second with walking by a brook, the third with a gathering of country folk, maybe to dance, the fourth with a thunderstorm, the fifth with a shepherd's song in the post-storm lull. As we produce our Arcadian home movie in our heads, the fact that most of the symphony is in a major key also feels right. F major and B flat major for the second movement. How could such a tranquil and how could such tranquil or uplifting episodes to do with the natural beauty and sunlight be translated into anything but the major mode? The major in post-enlightenment Western culture is the musical counterpart to an expression of happiness. Since the Aristotelian schema, which defines most of Western culture, or much of Western culture, deems to the comic or the joyous a minor aesthetic value, it follows that the major should also be minor or less serious. Major works 
in the major mode should be the exception rather than the norm. There seem to be any number of great compositions in major scales in the classical period, but with Beethoven, the extreme individuality of his romantic phase seems contained for the lay contemporary listener whose tastes have been shaped by romanticism in the minor keys of the fifth and ninth symphonies and the arresting second movement of the seventh. The major scale to us is the scale of happiness, a minor emotion. The minor or dissonant scales are the scales of deeper and major shifts in re register. It's right then that the pastoral's fourth movement, the storm, should migrate to F minor. To the lay listener, the major and minor keys in Western music are inseparable from my mises. Some works in Western music have overt representational content. That is, they're about something and they mimic what they're about. The flight of the bumblebee comes to mind, Peter and the wolf pictures at an exhibition. But all Western music for the ordinary listener, including some who, because of their circumstances, might presume that Western music is music, has a mimetic ethos pertaining not just to particular compositions, but to the happy and the sad scales, and on the opposite pole, the difficult 20th century developments of dissonance and atonality, which are occasionally presumed to represent in some way the trauma of the modern, that is the European modern, the breakdown of cultures, civilizations, and selves. This mimetic quality makes Western music the natural choice for scoring movies. The deep link between sound and narrative imagery in Western culture is exemplified by the fact that there's hardly any cinema without background music. To not hear a tune set to a major key when the day is sunny and the windows open, or when the protagonist has received a long-awaited appointment letter or fallen in love, is unimaginable. To not have notes in a minor key accompany loss, separation, or farewell is similarly rare. Suspense and terror are augmented by dissonance or by chromatic notes in dizzying succession. Instruments participate in mimesis. Flutes and pipes reproduce bird call in the pastoral, as they do avian excitement in Peter and the Wolf. The harumphing bassoon embodies in the latter the grandfather. These effects are recognized with delight by the audience because presumably tonality had been anthropomorphized by the late 18th century. This means that classical music could later be used with comic timing in visual narratives that emerged al alongside cinema like the Disney cartoon or Hanna-Barbera's Hanna Tom and Jerry, which themselves comprise wonderful anthropomorphic dramas. Tempo too signals the protagonist's journey, psychological, spiritual, physical. Adagio isn't just a slowing down, it has con connotations of emotional heaviness. The slowness of alap in khayal, on the other hand, is unrelated to human allegory. Expansiveness of form gives center stage to the raga rather than the human. The listener finds the raga isn't an expression of human consciousness, but that it stands on its borderline. Indian films can be scored with Indian classical music on narrative principles because music is malleable to new purposes and contexts. To give only one instance, Rag Tori, whose second, third, and sixth notes are flat, has, because of its air of being a minor scale, been used as background in Hindi cinema for scenes of mourning and tragedy. But this has little to do with the way it's sung or played by instrumentalists. Tori is a mourning rag. Like other rags, it resists interpretation and is undertaken by musicians both as a formal exploration and a meditation. The flat notes have formal and meditative implications, but not humanistic ones, whereby they represent sadness. Scoring films with Indian classical music can also be based on pure misunderstanding, as in Pasolini's great version of Medea. Pasolini uses a few notes from the Drupad singers, the Dagar brothers, to suggest foreboding, possibly because the music and the style of singing sound alien to him. In the Drupad itself, those notes would comprise an, an establishing of and dwelling on the raga. They'd have no added meaning, as added meaning would be redundant. Their proper visual accompaniment would be a blank screen.
Satyajit Ray, probably the most musically intelligent of the art house auteurs and unusual in being an Indian who was beholden to European classical music, recognizes mimesis and the lack of it in music as a problem of a particular order for the filmmaker. According to Ray, who began scoring his films early on, there was an quote, absence of a dramatic narrative tradition in Indian music. It is valid to speak of a Beethoven symphony in terms of universal brotherhood or man's struggle against fate or the passionate outpourings of a soul in torment. Western classical music underwent a process of humanization with the invention of the sonata form with its masculine first subjects and feminine subjects and their interweaving and progress through a series of dramatic key changes to a point of culmination. But a raga is a raga. End quote. Whether or one whether or not one agrees with the details of Ray's account, one feels instinctively with him that for the listener, the lay listener after the Enlightenment, the human story is at the core of their experience of Western music. In which case, one should also follow up on and possibly go beyond the assertion that a raga is a raga. I was listening to von Karajan's Beethoven in that flat, building castles in the air as I did, but I'd also begun to grapple with Indian classical music. Well before I'd understood the time signatures or, how, or knew how to fill up the space provided by the khayal, I realized that the raga had a relationship to the world that was different from that of Western music. Standing between cultures, I had to navigate my way. Firstly, every raga in North Indian music has a time and sometimes a season of performance. It isn't or shouldn't, that is, it would be plain odd to perform it without adhering to the time of day or season in which it's supposed to be performed. Kedar is sung after 8 o'clock in the evening and to sing it at twilight at 6 p.m. might create slight discomfiture. I needn't mention the inc incredulity a singer would face if they performed Kedar in the morning. The same holds true of a seasonal rag like Meg, literally cloud, which is retrieved and added to the repertoire specifically for the duration of the monsoons. It would be strange to hear a musician playing Meg in the winter. Ragas are discussed in Bharat's treatise on performance Natya Shastra from the 2nd century BC. But there's no mention of the constraints of time and season in Bharat. According to the scholar Mukundalat, seasonal proprieties to do with rags surface in texts from the 10th and 11th century. The proprieties of time in the 12th. So the very particular and peculiar relationship between the raga and the world has been with us for roughly seven or 800 years. There is no obvious or mimetic or representational or narrative connection between a raga and a time of day or season as there is, say, between Beethoven's Sixth Symphony and Spring Nature and the Countryside. An evening rag might be predominantly in the major mood like Kedar and Chayanat. It could have flats in the second and sixth notes and a sharp fourth like Puriya Dhanashri or Paraj. It could have a flat third, sixth, and seventh like Darbari. However, the morning rags Asavari and Jaunpuri also have the same flat third, sixth, and seventh. The springtime rag Basant has the same flats and sharps as the evening rag Purvi. So does the morning rag Lalit Gauri. The morning rag Bilawal, which is a major scale, has almost the same notes as the evening rags Kedar, Khamaj, and Desh. The monsoon rag Gormalhar and the afternoon rag, Gaur Sarang. What I mean is that there are no scales or sets of notes in North Indian classical music that have a reliable mimetic identity by which we can safely associate them with morning or night, light or dark, joy or sadness. The relationship that the rag has to the time of day or season, that is the world to the world, is not narrative or representational, but linguistic. I mean, the relationship between rag, kedar and evening is as arbitrary and ineluctable as the relationship between the word evening itself and that time of the day. Arbitrary in that evening as a term has no inherent evening-like qualities. Unlike onomatopic words, 
say glug with reference to swallowing water, its sound doesn't mimic what it means. Yet the relationship is ineluctable too. Once we are aware of language and who isn't, it becomes for us the world it refers to. To use morning to refer to evening would lead to a dissonance. Similarly to sing the morning rag Bhairav in the evening is not so much inadmissible as incongruous. One reason we are aware of the rags, one, once, sorry, once we are aware of the rags, they become part of what can only be called a linguistic or textual consciousness of the world and the present moment. The world being in this case India or North India. Music becomes a text which is not so much about the, about the world, but which is, like language, indistinguishable from it, from its waning and returning of light, its subtle changes of weather. Given the representational quality of the pastoral symphony, given that it's about spring, it's perfectly possible to perform it when it's not spring, that is, all year round. Given the linguistic uh, 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 all year round because the performance is a narration to be undertaken at any time. It can be undertaken at any time as a narration. Given the linguistic and textual nature of North Indian music, Basant, the springtime rag, must be performed only in the springtime. The season and weather and not just the notes of the composition are part of the raga's textuality. The raga is not about the world, it's of it. Once you know the rag, the world and it can't be independent of each other. In the way, it's impossible to grasp the physical outside of the language in which we think or feel. As the raga is of the world, its primary location is not a concert space or even in the courts and temples in which it once unfolded. It's situated really in a time of day or season. And in contrast to how we experience music in a concert hall, a significant amount of leakage in both directions is allowed the ragas into the world, the worlds into the raga. For this reason, every sound, bird call, a car horn, a cough, is continuous with its peculiar textuality. I probably first began to notice the everyday as a 17 or 18 year old through Indian music performances, reordering of my idea of what a relationship with my surroundings comprised. As a result of this situatedness, a raga that's sung at a time of day it's not meant for is subjected, in the critic Raghav Menon's words, to jet lag. The metaphor of intercontinental travel emphasizes the textuality of North Indian music. When I practiced the morning rag Tori in Oxford, I experienced an in compatibility. This is because the morning in Oxford is not only a different reality, it's a different language. The problem of making Tori fit is a translational one. I'm not claiming that the Raga belongs organically to the Indian landscape. I'm saying that while language is local and provisional, it also becomes our experience of the universe. As North Indian music reminds us, India is a text. Only a relatively small bit of reality can be conveyed by narrating stories about it or representing it in pictures. We participate in reality by experiencing language at its most arbitrary basic level of meaning. Kedar is evening, Bhairav is morning, evening is a time of day which occurs before night. This constant embrace of textuality is how we elect to live in the world. The singer is reminded of this every time they sing a rag. One should also concede that a culture that privileges narrative and representation also privileges the author or composer who gives birth to the piece of representation as with uh, Beethoven. A culture that gives primacy to language as with the North Indian classical music tradition, will relegate the composer to secondary or invisible status and see text as the primary progenitor. That is why most rags have no known composers and who the composer might be is of secondary interest. What is a raga? The question can be approached in many ways and I'll restrict myself for now to the context I've created of Indian music as text or language.
The raga has no more an absolute identity than a word does. Ferdinand de Saussure's claim that language is a social fabric marked, marked by difference is equally true of ragas. There's nothing about the word bat, for instance, that makes it intrinsically refer to that animal. Bat, as is the case with other words, is not an absolute. It's a sign and a sound that's related to all similar sounds and signs that it is not, like bed or bud or butt. This, as we know, is what Saussure means by difference, that the way language and its meanings consist of negative differentiations. Similarly, evening means what it does, not because it has an automatic God-granted link with that time of day, but because its sound distinguishes it from other sounds that have different meanings and thereby determines its own meaning. Avenue and awning, for instance. Derrida, in recognition of Saussure's insight that the word isn't born with an eternal fixed identity, poetically calls this absence of fixity a trace. This is one way of understanding the rag. It has no fundamentally recognizable, recognizable existence in isolation from other ragas. It is recognizable through differentiation. It is the ragas that it is not. So the default response of the critic or the pedant to a performance is to look not for faulty pitch or lack of emotion or virtuosity, but to an absence of mindfulness on the performer's part to do with how one raga might end up, if he's not careful, becoming another one. So this kind of comment is very common in a, in, in a review. His Marwa quite often sounded like Puriya and at times became Sohini too, the critic might remark. In relation to three ragas that have identical notes, a flat re or second note, a normal ga or third, a sharp ma or fourth, and a normal dha and ni or sixth and seventh. Marwa identifies itself by gracefully abstaining from the tonic and visiting it almost reluctantly, by dwelling largely on the relationship between the flat re or second and the normal dha or sixth. Puriya progresses far more linearly. Sohini jumps straight to the upper tonic and compositions in this rag largely hover up there. Each of these rags is unmistakable, each is also a trace. Okay, thank you. I have a question about something, oh thank you by the way for that. Um, I have a question about something that in some ways doesn't really signify for your talk but that was nagging at me as you were speaking, which is to say, I, I want to kick back a little bit against your characterization of Western classical music as so wholly mimetic and narrative. It's, yes, it's, it's a mischaracterization. You, it's, it's a deliberate mischaracterization, but it's it's provoke. It, to me, it feels provoking rather than provocative. Just you know, the even if you move to the late string quartets instead of the symphonies, it's already less true even just of Beethoven. And certainly if you think about the longer tradition, the importance of liturgical music in earlier periods, and the ways that for you know 20th century composers like Vaughan Williams in Britain, those liturgical elements that are exactly in the same way that you're talking about grounded um, in the shape, in the movement through the year, and the uh, um, and the and the different you know the, the the different divisions of the day that you have coming out of that monastic tradition. So as to say, I, in a way, I felt that the the tr it, you may be better off rhetorically compressing you know doing the are, are the, doing the equation of the Western classical tradition to the mimetic more as a brief rhetorical gesture rather than at, in this more extended way treating it because the longer you spend developing that idea the more strongly you know we're we're all kicking back with our counterexamples or sure. you know or protesting this deliberate misrepresentation. Well, the deliberate misrepresentation comes from uh, a, a memory of how I received the music and how I heard it. And uh, as I said, it doesn't, the, the book is not about Western classical music, it's about um, how one sort of can't escape seeing musical traditions with, from 
one from the prism of another tradition, especially if you grew up as I did, in between cultures. And um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm interested in uh, how um, a post-romantic, post-enlightenment culture, which we have all inherited, uh, whatever our color or um, uh, uh, cultural background, um, what happens to that um, particular kind of formation when we begin to attend to it being tested all the time from outside? Because that formation, in some ways, gives us a very central language with which to understand things. Um, and it's only uh, if one were to go more deeply into that tradition, as it's completely possible to do in any of its kind of art practices, whether it's music or drama or, or whatever, one would find uh, that, 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 that that tradition is far more heterogeneous, not only heterogeneous, but doesn't subscribe to those post-romantic or post-enlightenment parameters with which you understand Western tradition. But then Western tradition also becomes a way of understanding art practice or thinking itself. In a way that it gets internalized, so, so that I don't even want to just call it Western tradition. But, but that internalization soon begins to be tested. And at the age of 16 or 17, you, you find it being tested. Um, and I, I would be sort of diluting the power of the mimetic in my life and mimetic understanding of uh, or representational or narrative understanding of, of what to be looking for in things and what to value in things, Di I would be diluting it if I, if I didn't give it its central, central place at that point of time when it w from which I had to emerge. And then, of course, I mean, um, if, if, if this were a book about Western classical music, one could, um, one could expose the, the limitations of that model very quickly by looking at Western classical music itself. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, th th this, is, this is something that at that point of time was, was very central. I think it continues to be very central. I mean, certain things uh, that I refer to over here, for instance, to do with what with th the words we use, like major and minor, which have a, have a kind of a counterpart in musical vocabulary as well, but, but have a counterpart in, other, I, I, in the way we talk about books and what we think of as major books or major works or minor works. Uh, the, uh, various other words like developed or developing um, uh, come with an, an entire value system uh, which I think is quite interconnected. And uh, when looking at music, we, we can't kind of discount the presumptions behind what it is that we think constitutes a major ambition uh, or a major work and, and what the appropriate vocabulary of a major work should be. Um, and then you come across a musical tradition like Indian classical music, which obviously doesn't, doesn't emerge from that vocabulary and has a different way of, of uh, understanding um, scales and the way we listen to scales and the way we listen to music, which when as a kind of person educated in another tradition is imbued with expectations of the major and minor in a qu quite a different way. Yes, uh, I would like to know uh, what do you think about the experience between Ravi Shankar and Yehudi Menuhin, because you seem to oppose, to oppose uh, West and East, but there is this uh, very uh, famous example that uh, ca this music can be, uh, can be understood by West and by uh, East. So I would like very much to have your, your point of view uh, concerning the meeting and the friendship between Ravi Shankar and Yehudi Menuhin. Um, I think Yehudi Menuhin, I, I think, uh, went 
I, I don't know a great deal about, I mean, beyond what you know, I mean, uh, about, about their, their partnership and collaboration, but uh, um, I think he, he tried to go kind of deep into Indian classical tradition, but he wasn't, I don't, th I mean, at that time, Men Menuhin's comments seem to be the comments emerging from a longer tradition of uh, Western uh, humanism from uh, the late uh, 18th century to the early 19th century onwards, especially the work of the Orientalist scholars who uh, discovered that um, discovered that certain languages had a, had common roots or, or commonalities, and so that, that then then the the kind of project be became about dis discovering these commonalities. Uh, so it begins with people like Orientalists like William Jones who di who, who posits something called the Indo-European languages, and uh, it seems to me Menuhin is in in that kind of in that kind of search for universality among among these cultures and finds a, a definite kind of. Um, it's not tested in the way that I feel tested by, by, by these kind of uh, um, discrepancies, but feels music is part of some kind of universal inheritance. And, and I think there is, a, there is a definite, as far as uh, uh, high culture is concerned, for, for if we just restrict ourselves to that for a second, I mean, like the classical traditions, the so-called classical traditions of, of civilizations, then um, there is a moment when, then there's an exhilarating moment when uh, people begin to, in the late 18th, early 19th century, uh, um, in the West, discover the Upanishads and and other texts and 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 translate them into French among other languages, and 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 suddenly say that well, humanism we thought it only came from. Uh, I'm thinking of Raymond Schwab actually. Okay, it came from the Mediterranean basin. It actually extends much further. It came from. So the, 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 that's it's a very exhilarating move. Yet, of course, the, the 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 search for a kind of universal paradigm for that humanism continues and um, inflects the way music is looked at slightly cheesily, you know, creates this kind of idea of music as some kind of universal brotherhood. The two, the two um, artists or thinkers who differ from this and are aware of having to negotiate or the implications of ne negotiating different traditions uh, is Tagore, I think, and, and Satyajitre, whom I mentioned earlier. And Sat Satyajitre is, um, he stops short at the fact that you cannot use the raga as, uh, uh, just simply pick it up and use it as background score, because it doesn't quite fit into a, a, a particular um, context of narrative ex uh, expectation and narrative expectation itself connected to a, a particular kind of humanistic story. And, 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 and Ray sees, sees that, well, uh, this isn't working because this isn't part actually of that humanism. Um, so uh, uh, I, I can't use the raga actually in that way in the background. So, so you know, uh, I find Ray's, um, the way Ray pauses and the way Tagore pauses in the late 19th century, uh, more interesting than the exhilarating, but then, you know, um, gradually exhausted uh, um, vocabulary of, of, of uh, commonality and, br and, and, and brotherhood and, and common inheritance. Hello, hi. Um, so thanks again for that. So I wanted to dwell a little, dwell a little more on this uh, pushing back against narrative. And um, so when you, uh, so uh, you used um, narrative and mimesis, perhaps in a slightly interchangeable way, while discussing uh, your reception of Western classical music. But in opposition, you spoke also of a kind of uh, life-likeness, mm -hmm. which is a constant revisiting of the present moment. But um, so a as a writer or a musician, I mean, so how, how what are the strategies of achieving that life-likeness without mimesis or, or without any form of narrative attached to it? I, I don't know if that's a very clear question. 
Thank you. Very clear. Excellent question. You are right to draw this parallel in, in what I'm saying, this kind of convergence between the way I'm talking about narrative as a writer and uh, mimesis as, as, a, as, a, as a kind of listener or, uh, uh, and, and, and connecting it to my sort of understanding of Western music and uh, Indian music's departure from, from mimesis. Um, let, um, as far as as far as uh, narrative is concerned, I suppose um, I mean uh, what I uh, am sort of looking at is a a model where um, you you have a sequence of moments or paragraphs or or, or, or whatever um, in 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 a in a story or in any kind of narrative form in fiction. Um, and yet e uh, each paragraph or each sentence also works on another level in terms of if it's extr extricated from the narrative it is still able to have the potential of throwing up a different story. That is it, it has a, the quality of a beginning. So I suppose I, what I'm interested in as a writer and, I've, and, I, and I know that the, the, the filmmaker Money Call also wanted to, to create a cinema in which every shot was an opening shot. I'm interested in the fact that opening shots or opening paragraphs um, have no narrative function. Uh, if, you, if, you look at, uh, if you look at the, the, the opening paragraph or the, even the opening page of a story or the opening page of a novel or the opening one and a half pages of a novel, if you'll find it imbued with a kind of excitement, and the exci excitement is the excitement of possibility. It's not the excitement of narrative. Then, uh, after one and a half pages have passed, the writer then must get on with it. And, and, uh, um, and that unshackled air uh, is, is, is sort of, it gives way to something else. Now, is, is it possible to, to, to create a narrative entirely of opening pages or opening paragraphs? Uh, so so, um, so I, I think that, uh, um, the, the, the nature of introductions uh, is what I'm looking at as a, a zone in which uh, nothing is resolved. How long can we create a sequence of such moments? And now, in, in Khayal 2, as I said earlier, the introduction, nobody thinks of it as the introduction. Nobody thinks, well, this bit is called the alap, which means introduction. I must finish it in two minutes and get on with it. They know that the introduction is where the core of the the kind of you know the 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 exploration lies so uh, um so i, th I suppose i'm i'm looking at at uh, re related things in different genres and related ways of accommodating thinking about the possibility of these things yeah Real good <laughs> so i want to say thanks for the uh thought provoking talk and i have one sort of comment observation and then a question for you. So the first um, uh, thing is as a contemporary composer myself of, uh, of music, um, my experience has been often with audiences that whether I want it to be this way or not, that people hear things in a narrative way, especially when course, they're yeah. unfamiliar with contemporary mm -hmm. music. I think that that's a common reaction to, in order to try to confront something that's strange to you, that you try to make a, a story to relate with it in your head to either your own personal Absolutely. experience. Um, so I wasn't uh, over here talking about the narrative impo uh, intention of the composer. Sure. I was talking exa uh, exactly about what you're saying, the way yeah. it's received, the way it's heard, the way it's interpreted. Right, yeah. exactly. And I th what I'd be interested to know is that if, you, if you had Western listeners who are not familiar with this tradi traditional music that you're playing, whether the same thing would happen, where it, because it's unfamiliar, you'd have this this sort of inclination to try to make a narrative, even if it's a raga that is intended for the evening. Um, that I, I don't know if it's as divided. I, I could see it going both ways culturally, where 
I think it's sort of human nature to try to connect with something we're unfamiliar with through the lens of narrative. So that, that was one comment. Then the other question I had for you, which you know maybe this is something that you'll eventually address later in your book, is um, the difference between notation and improvisation and whether that plays into your understanding of these musics at all um, in terms of having something be more prescribed, especially in Western classical music, versus traditions uh, like the one that y you practice yourself from what I understand, of course, it's studied and there's certain norms and forms and scales that are familiar and expectations, but there is also a certain degree of freedom. I wonder if you could talk a little bit of how improvisation versus notation plays into what you've been speaking of in relation to narrative. Um, so the first thing that you uh, talked about, I mean, um, whether whether West, some Western people listen to Indian music in, in a narrative way or whether some Indian people also might kind of listen to it in a narrative way. And I think um, a, an Indian classical audience, even if, if it's not a, an audience f uh, that comprises people trained uh, in classical music, because really to completely understand uh, uh, Indian classical music and take full pleasure in it, one does need to be trained in it, if only because the time signatures are so important. So there's so much play with the time signatures that uh, a, a whole dimension of the performance uh, remains kind of guesswork for the, for the listener and uh, they go with the flow and, and when somebody who understands what this, the performer has done and nods vigorously or the performer himself gives a signal I've done something amazing, then uh, uh, the, the, the person also gets excited. But, uh, but that's guesswork. A very mi a small minority actually uh, knows the, the, the time signatures. So, but even so, I would say that as they're listening to the rag and the, and the um, and I, I don't know about Western uh, uh, listeners, but uh, especially a completely lay listener. But when an Indian listeners are, even if they're fairly kind of untrained, but are listening to the rag, I think they are listening uh, for, um, if they know the rag at all, they know that in this rag, so they're listening to the relationship between the notes, which is what a rag is. So, uh, um, there is a, let's say, movement between the fifth note to downward movement to the second note in let's say two rags, Chaya Nut and Yaman Kalyan. So, uh, so they're listening to, so they have uh, these other rags in their head, but they also have an expectation that, uh, well, at some point he is going to, or she is going to come back from the fifth to the second. That's, that's the expectation. How will she do it? Um, how, at what point is it going to happen? Um, the, the expectations have to do with what brings us to the second bit of, the, of your question, with the nature of improvisation, which is deferral. So, um, so improvisation is basically deferral. Imp improvisation in Indian music consists of uh, delaying as much or not doing what you have to do to adhere to the form. You are adhering to the form, but you're doing it in a deliberately um, reluctant fashion. In the reluctance lies a great deal of beauty. In the resistance lies a great deal. You, you can't deviate from the norm, uh, from, the, from, the, from the shape. Because, because then it becomes a different rag. You can't do that. Improvisation is not deviation from the particular shape of the rag that the notes have given it and the relationship between the notes have given. Because the relationship means everything because there can be, as I said, two rags of identical notes, but it's the relationship between them and how they climb of or come down again that determines which rag it is, but not only determines which rag it is, but determines the nature of expectation in the li listener and the nature of how, how far the, the, the musician um, immediately gives into those ex expectations or resists them. 
And improvisation is about resistance. That, that's how it works. So, um, I had a question about the text itself that that you read, and uh, yeah. which in 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 some ways is uh, the, the 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 story of how you became a musician, uh, and uh, and I wonder to what extent you uh, understand this text as a as a narrative. Is it something that you fully embrace, or is it a reluctant embrace of the of the narrative form? <laughs> Um, I think uh, it's it's it was probably um, this kind of uh, discussion was a as, was an opportunity for me to go off in different directions while unfolding a story to do with the consequences of my discovery. Or, or becoming more seriously interested in 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 the Indian classical tradition, so the consequences had to do with, okay, now what do you understand by author? You used to think that Beethoven, having a Beethoven means having a possessing a great tradition, but here is a great tradition which has no Beethoven because he doesn't have any conception of, of, of authorship in this particular way. Not that there aren't authors; there are there are great authors, but just over here. It has no use for that tradition. So, so on the one hand, I'm looking at the arc which leads me to have having to deal with these kind of um, questions and making kind of sense of 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 why one tradition values something while another tradition has no use for it. Um, at, at the same time, I want to talk about uh, uh, other things to do with, for instance, how is it possible to do this in Bombay on the 25th floor in the Cuff, in, Cuff, in Cuff Parade? I'm, I'm also kind of, how is it possible to have that journey there? Um, I'm also kind of looking at that particular world and um, and seeing it as a, a, as a world with its own unexpectedness. So, you know, um, then I'm of course bringing in things which are of interest to me as a novelist which have to do with what I've just discussed earlier, the setting aside of this compulsion to, to complete or fully represent something for this moment of the beginning where nothing is really addressed and the impact of that moment. So um, I'm taking this as an opportunity to, to bring all of those kind of selves into play o over here. Uh, first of all, thank you. It was very wonderful to hear you read, and one, and especially um, to share in your process of discovery. It was something special about seeing you looking for the for the next word, uh, as if you were sort of making it up on the spot or trying to rediscover it. There's something something wonderful about that, and something very generous about your doing so. Thank I you. wanted to ask you about your, your uh, about how you work. Um, I, I, other people have asked this too uh, and, and your own writing practice I'm thinking about Fitzgerald saying that he wanted a zinger on every page maybe more than one or about Ralph Ellison saying he was an ac anecdotal writer and his big problem was trying to figure out how to put the pieces together he could do 50 pieces but in, in, in your case you're um, the idea of points of entry seems to be holding the, this together, and there's certain kind of homing keys that you come back to, the 25th floor, looking for entrances, these sort of meditations on certain questions. And I wonder if you start with a, do you have an outline that you're working from, or do you, Sasha was going to be suggesting, moving along uh, with an improvisatory impulse with the sense of these, kind of poet poet's sense of, these uh, conversation pieces echoing in your head. Um, th thank you, um, uh, Robert. Um, uh, I think I ha have a whole kind of bunch of things in my head that I want to write about when it comes to this book. But they also, also, also kind of uh, comprise paradoxical images and moments in one's life. 
So it's not themes. I mean, I mean um, but I don't see the pursuit of, 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 of writing about a constellation of, of moments uh, incompatible with, uh, with a thought process or, 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 or a critical inquiry into, into something. So I suppose a, a kind of essay gives you a, a model uh, um, as to how to proceed. I think um, testing the form of, of the essayistic uh, could be one way of, of kind of um, proceeding um, where one has a, a, a kind of um, cluster of things one is looking at. Uh, but I think that is also true of the way I write fiction. So um, I don't panic too much about what comes after what. You know, I, 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 as a fiction writer, I, I might think, um, well, I, I want to write about this. Today I want to write about this, and then I want to write about that. And I write about this, and I think, now the next thing that I want to write about is just... I cannot coerce it now. I cannot bring that in now. So when do I write about that? I really want to write about that. I think, okay, let it be because something else is emerging from this particular paragraph. Uh, let, it, let it come back when it will. And it, and it does come back sometimes. If it doesn't, too bad. You know? But, but what, I'm, what I mean is, um, as, as a fiction writer, I, I, the paragraph is, 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 a, is an extremely important unit to me. Uh, j just... Uh, in the way that some people say sentences are uh, important units if the paragraph uh, is is a is something for me i've always thought of as belonging to a development but also something that should be uh, um, extricable from it and have its own life outside it because that's how i encountered the parag paragraph as almost as a quotation i like the idea of the quotation as well i like the idea that modernists Assembled quotations. I like anybody who assembles quotations. I like the I, I like the um, the ambition to assemble quotations. I suppose I mean that that's the way I'm working here as well. Uh, you know, I probably haven't said anything that made any sense uh, in 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 this regard. But but you know, I mean, so that there are these multiple kind of impulses to assemble. Things which are both singular and have an end independent entity, but also connected to each other. Does that make? It, does that answer you at all? No, you're just being polite, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Related thing. I yeah. wonder, just day by day, does that mean that you sit down and you read everything you've written so far for this piece? Yeah. And you know what's next no, already, I, or you let the 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 uh, momentum tell you where to go next yeah both i mean i i <laughs> i mean I, I i i i read what i've written and then it tells me where to go next yeah <laughs> which is probably true of everybody thank you thank you very much so on that note let us conclude this thank lecture thank you very much thank you